Well, the passage that we are going to be looking at today is Hebrews chapter 12 and verses 18 through 29. Um, before we get into that, the song that we were singing earlier it is uh, grace that is greater than our sin. And it really does match well with the message that we're looking at today. It says, marvelous grace of our loving Lord, grace that exceeds our sin and our guilt. Yonder on Calvary's mount top poured, there where the blood of the lamb was spilled. That to me just speaks so much as to why we have the privileges of the new covenant of Christ in it with us today. And with that in mind, when I were singing some of the songs, there's a passage out of Colossians that I speaks to the supremacy of Christ, which is essentially, if you want to put the nutshell of what the book of Hebrews is all about, it is about the supremacy of Christ. It is about how Christ is supreme above everything that comes out of the Old Testament. It's more supreme than the angels, more supreme than the prophets, than of Moses and Aaron. And the passage is from 1 Colossians. And you guys can read this along on page 233 out of the hymnal. And... Uh, uh, he is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation, for by him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things were created by him and for him. He is before all things, and in him, that's Christ, all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that everything he might have the supremacy. For God has was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. You were once alienated from God and were enemies in your minds because of your evil behavior. But now he has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you holy in his sight without blemish and free from accusation if you continue in your faith, establish and firm, not moved from the hope held out in the gospel. This is the gospel that you have heard and that has been proclaimed to every creature under heaven and of which I, Paul, have become a servant. And that is just so much uh, a dovetail into what we are looking at today with Hebrews chapter 12. And this being Father's Day, one of the things, a, a common mis misconception that we have, I think a lot of people in the world that haven't read the Bible, that God is this white-haired fatherly figure up in heaven with a lightning bolt ready to throw it at anyone he wants. That's the kind of the figure that I believe that the world has of God, especially of God the Father. And Jesus is that person that, um, is the loving person. And this is the something that um, I really truly believe that we need to understand differently because John 3.16 says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. And that's so important for us to remember that he is such a loving father that he was willing to sacrifice his only begotten son for us. And not to leave him there, obviously, but to rise from the dead so that he would have a place of preeminence and that he would be our advocate in heaven. <laughs> that being said, the question that I want to ask us today is, which mountain is your foundation? There's two mountains in this passage that we're looking at today. But before we read this passage, let's pray and ask God to bless his word. 
Our dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word that you have given to us and that you have given it to us to understand you, to be blessed by it, and to have salvation through it. And Lord, we pray that right now as we look at your word that you would open our eyes to what you have us to learn. And we just thank you so much for this opportunity to be here as your family and be here to listen to what you have to say. And we pray all these things in your son's name. Amen. Starting at verse 18. For you have not come to a mountain that can be touched into a blazing fire and to darkness and gloom and a whirlwind and to the blast of the trumpet and the sound of the words which sound such as that those who heard begged that no further would be spoken to them. For they could not hear the command even if a beast touches could not bear the command that even if a beast touches the mountain, it will be a stone. And so terrible was the sight that Moses said, I am full of fear and trembling. But you have come to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to myriads of angels, to the general assembly and the church of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven, and to God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of the righteous made perfect, and to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood which speaks better than the blood of Abel. See to it that you do not refuse him who is speaking. For if those did not escape when they refused him, who warned them on earth, much less will we escape who turn away from him who warns from heaven. And his voice shook the earth then, but now he has promised, saying, Yet once more I will shake not only the earth, but also the heaven. This expression, yet once more, denotes the removing of those things which can be shaken, as of created things, so that those things which cannot be shaken may remain. Therefore, since we receive a kingdom which cannot be shaken, let us show gratitude by which we may offer to God an acceptable service with reverence and awe, for our God is a consuming fire. Thanks be to God for his wonderful and glorious word. So what mountain is our foundation on? We looked at two mountains here today. And what we're seeing here in this passage, we need to remember who the audience is. It's to a Hebrew Christian New Covenant Church. And they um, had experienced a lot of people falling away because of pressure, because of intimidation. And they left and they went back to Judaism. Now, this wasn't just your standard um, intimidation of just, uh, but this was like severe bullying. People lost their property. And this is how, why they ended up giving up. And they said, okay, I'm going to go back to Judaism. And so the author of Hebrews is trying to present a message, not only of warning to those who have left, but comfort to those who have stayed and have withstood the trials and the tribulation and the discipline that, he, that they've gone through. And we discovered some of that discipline, and we talked about that last week that they had gone through. And so but he, in this passage here, first he comes to the mountain of fire and fury. And uh, obviously to the minds of to the Hebrew audience, this is Sinai when they were in the wilderness wanderings. And as they came to this mountain, this is where God gave the law to the people of Israel. And at this time when they came, one of the things that uh, took place um, was that this was such a solemn moment. This was such a moment that was scary and awful to, for the people of Israel when they were at this mountain. And this is taken from Exodus chapter 19. The Lord also said to Moses, and this is an, an event, we could put a picture in our mind's eye, what's taking place 
at Mount Sinai. They've just come out of Egypt. And here they are. And God is about to give them a law to follow as a nation. And it says, The Lord also said to Moses, Go to the people and consecrate them today and tomorrow and let them wash their garments and let them be ready for the third day. For on the third day, the Lord will come down on Mount Sinai in the sight of all people. You shall set bounds for the people all around, saying, Beware that you do not go up on the mountain or touch the border of it. Whoever touches the mountain shall surely be put to death. No hand shall touch him but he shall surely be stoned or shot through. Whether beast or man, he shall not live. When the ram's horn sounds a long blast, they shall come up on the mountain. So Moses went down from the mountain to all the people and consecrated the people, and they washed their garments. And he, he said to the people, Be ready for the third day. Do not go near a woman. So it came about on the third day when it was morning, that there were thunder and lightning flashes and a thick cloud upon the mountain and a very loud trumpet sound so that all the people who were in the camp trembled. And Moses brought the people out of the camp to meet God and they stood at the foot of the mountain. Now Mount Sinai was all in smoke because the Lord descended upon it in fire and its smoke ascended like the smoke of a furnace and the whole mountain quaked violently. When the sound of the trumpet grew louder and louder, Moses spoke, and God answered him with thunder. And the Lord came down on Mount Sinai to the top of the mountain. The Lord called Moses to the top of the mountain, and Moses went up. Then the Lord spoke to Moses, Go down and warn the people so they do not break through to the Lord to gaze, and many of them perish. Now another passage I want to take us to comes out of, the, out of Exodus chapter 20, the next chapter. And it says in verse 18 and 19 of, verse 20, of chapter 20, All the people perceived the, the thunder and the lightning flashes and the sound of the trumpet and the mountain smoking. And when the people saw it, they trembled and stood at a distance. Then they said to Moses, Speak to us yourself, and we'll listen. But let not God speak to us, or we will die. This is the picture, this awesome picture of this mountain of do not touch, do not go near. This is an inapproachable God picture that is being perceived here. God wants to give them a picture of his holiness, of how pure he is, and how just he is in all he does. And when he gave the commands, which are throughout the book of Exodus and Deuteronomy and Numbers, they begin to see that God is a pure and a holy God. And that he was inapproachable. But the, the author here is using this metaphor as a mountain in the same way that the apostle Paul does. In um, in Galatians chapter 4, Paul the Apostle uses a similar metaphor. And in Galatians chapter 4, verses 21 through 31, he, he speaks about a, excuse me, apologize for that. The pastor had his phone on. So in, in Galatians chapter 4, that he talks about two women. He talks about Sarah and Hagar. Both the spouse, well, Sarah was the spouse of Abraham, and Hagar was, was, was not, but he was rather one of her slaves. It was actually one of Sarah's slaves. And when that took place, when this took place, Sarah was the, was the mother of who? the mother of Isaac. And Hagar was the mother of who? Ishmael. And when that was born, Paul the apostle uses that as a picture of the two covenants. He uses um, 
Sarah as a picture of the new covenant and uses Hagar as a picture of the old covenant. And that comes out of Galatians chapter 4. So that's one analogy or allegory that Paul even states. He says this is an allegory that he's using. And even though we're talking about Mother's Day, Father's Day, um, it's interesting. He says, now Hagar is this Mount Sinai in Arabia and corresponds to the president of Jerusalem for she is in slavery with her children, but, Jerus but the Jerusalem above is free. She is our mother. It's kind of interesting. Like I said, even though it's Father's Day, we're using this passage and we're talking about Mother's Day a little bit. But he talks about how these two things, how he uses these pictures to compare the old and the new covenant. And the picture that the author is using here in Hebrews is two mountains. And that is what he does, this temporary picture, because the next picture is the picture of the mountain of family and fellowship. We first looked at that mountain of fire and fury and of terrible awesomeness. Now he brings us to another mountain, the mountain of family and fellowship. And this is the Mount Zion. And he says, but you have come to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem and to myriads of angels. And one of the interesting things that I, I see in this picture is this Mount Sinai is in the wilderness. Now, Jerusalem is not when they were in the wandering times. They were settled in the land. But interestingly enough, he's not talking about Jerusalem there. He's talking about that final destination, that heavenly Jerusalem. He bypasses the earthly Jerusalem from the wilderness, and he immediately begins talking about that heavenly Jerusalem when he speaks here. But the language that we read is not of inapproachability, of don't come and touch the mountain. He, the, he begins and we hear different language altogether. He says, you have come to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God. Well, what do you do in a city? You live in a city. This mountain is a place where people dwell. This mountain is a place where people gather and live. And he says, and to the myriads of angels, and that other way, to, another um, translation called it, and thousands upon thousands of angels. And one of the things we discover in, in, in Jewish um, history is they believe that there were like a thousand angels for each person that was there in, at, at Sinai. And the author of Hebrews says, and to myriads, of angels to thousands upon thousands of angels that are there. But this language also says, it's, talks, it's inviting language. It's about residents who live on this mountain in this city, about people who dwell in it and live in the presence of God. Their family, because then he begins to say, and to the general assembly and the church of the firstborn, one of the interesting things is I've seen where two different camps of people, when they talk about the church of the firstborn, we learn in Hebrews chapter 1 that Christ is the firstborn. And people say, well, this is the statement of the church of the firstborn, that is the church of Christ, who are enrolled in heaven. But the other camp says that when he says the church of the firstborn, he's talking about those who were covered by the blood when the Passover angel went over the Hebrews when they were in the land of Egypt, we are covered by the blood of Christ and we are saved from death, from eternal death because of Christ and his shed blood that we are all that firstborn and that is the picture. And I believe that both of those can be actually be seen in that picture. There's the people of the, that he's preaching to our Hebrew people and he wants them to understand through the blood of Christ, your sins are covered. Through the blood of the Christ, you can come near to Christ. Through the blood of Christ, we can 
have God with us. And then he begins to say, um, and to the church of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven, and to God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of the righteous made perfect. So all the previous people that he's talked about, all the previous people of Israel, in chapter 11, we read about all those people that were the heroes of faith. These are the people that he's talking about here, all the people that have gone before in faith and have died. And now they are there in heaven. And he says to the general assembly, who all is in heaven, the angels, the general assembly, all those who have gone before the church of the firstborn and of the spirits of the righteous made perfect. And I love the message that he gives there that we don't make ourselves perfect. We don't make ourselves righteous. It's God through the blood of Jesus Christ. And that's what he speaks to here. And then he says, and to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood, which speaks better than the blood of Abel. See, no longer is the mediator between God and man, a feeble man who, once, who, who later died, but it is now the Lord Jesus Christ who lives forever. And he says, Be, because of this, because Jesus is our mediator, we have been sprinkled with his blood, which speaks better than the blood of Abel. We have the blood of forgiveness of Jesus Christ, not the blood of Abel, which cries out for vengeance. I was hearing someone talk about the movies of Hollywood today and everything that talks about vengeance and all the things, getting revenge on different things. You hear a lot of these stories, you know, a lot of the adventure movies are all about getting revenge. But Jesus, he speaks about forgiveness. No longer do we talk about getting vengeance, but we speak as Christians about forgiveness. And that's the hallmark of a Christian, that we are forgiving just as Christ forgave. And then an interesting thing that he says here, see to it that you do not refuse him who is speaking. And what is he, all of a sudden, it just jumps out of that passage. He goes, why is he talking about this? He's talking about that because up above, when we were, we were reading about in verse 19, and to the blast of the trumpet and the sound of the words, which sound was such that those who heard begged that no further word be spoken to them. We don't have to hear the word of God and say, I don't want to hear it. I fear hearing God's word. Now he wants us to embrace that word. He wants us to welcome it. He wants us to embrace what he has to say, just like the saints that are there in heaven who hear him every day. And this is a words of forgiveness that he has. And so he says, see to it that you do not refuse him who is speaking, and that is Christ. For if those did not escape when they refused him who warned him on earth, much less will we escape who turn away from him who warns from heaven. And the other thing that we need to remember here is even though we are welcome now on the mountain because of God's forgiveness, our God is still a holy God. He is still a righteous and a just God. And if we refuse to hear the message of the gospel, there is nothing but eternal damnation waiting for those who refuse to hear the message that God has given to us. And that is what he is speaking about here. Because God still is our judge, as we looked at in verse 23. But because he is our judge, he sees that we are covered with the blood of Christ, that we are sprinkled with the blood of forgiveness that he mentions right there in verse 24. We have a mediator of a new covenant, a new covenant of sprinkled blood, which speaks of forgiveness. And then we finally speak about our foundation and our future. And it says in verse 26, And his voice shook the earth then, but now he has promised, saying, 
Yet once more, I will shake not only earth, but also the heaven. This expression, yet once more, denotes removing of those things which can be shaken as of created things, so that those things which cannot be shaken may remain. How many of us have ever felt, gone through an earthquake tremor? And all of a sudden, what comes flying off the shelves? All sorts of different things. It's as if God is just taking and shift, is taking a, a pan and just sifting it and just seeing what's left over. But this is what happened at that mountain. The mountain shook so much. But the, you know what? It's saying here, this is going to happen again. This is going to happen once more. God is going to bring judgment once more, one more time at the end of all things. And he says this expression, yet once more, is a removing of those things. And I think that we can have that shaking take place in our life today, where we can separate out what is of gold and that is of wood, hay, and stubble in our lives. We can say, what are these things in our life that will not last? What are the things in our life that will last? And that is, I believe, also what he speaks to here. Because we need to look at what are we building on in our life? And are we building on wood, hay, and stubble? Are we building a life of a structure of God's love and forgiveness in our life, of patience and of long suffering towards other people. That's what he wants us to be doing. He wants us to be people of forgiveness. If God can forgive us, if he can forgive our sins, much more we should be able to do the same. We are God's people called to forgive others in our life. The passage that we looked at where he says, yet once more, I will shake not only earth, but also the heaven speaks of something that is comes from Haggai chapter two. And this he speaks of the future. He says, as for the promise, which I made for you, when you came up out of Egypt, my spirit is abiding in your midst. Do not fear for thus says the Lord of hosts, once more, in a little while, I'm going to shake the heavens and the earth, the sea also, and the dry land. I will shake all the nations, and they will come with the wealth of all nations, and I will fill this house with glory, says the Lord of hosts. One more time, God is going to shake this world. And we think that a lot of people in this world think that they're in position of power and authority and it's going to last. And, and this, that's such foolish thinking because we're temporal beings. We will die one day. And our fate is in the hands of a living God. We are the ones that are in a safe place. We are the ones that have received this kingdom. We are the ones who have built our foundation on the Lord Jesus Christ. I, I remember one time I was talking to someone and it was a couple of weeks ago and there was a community meeting here. And I don't even remember who the person was, but a lot of them came in and goes, man, I was kind of uh, scared of coming into church. I thought I might burst into flames. And I, thought, okay, this person probably thinks they're too much of a sinner to be around God. And I, and I said, you got that backwards. This is the place where you learn how to escape from the flames. This is the place when you hear the gospel, you find refuge. This is what that mountain is. It's that mountain of family and fellowship, but it's that place of refuge. Because when that final judgment day comes, if we are not seen in Christ, if we are not seen as covered with the blood of Christ, there only remains a judgment, an eternal judgment for those people. But I was glad to be able to share and with him and said, look, this you're in the safest place you can be right now. If you come back, you can learn more about the good news of Jesus Christ where you don't. I said, out there is where the flames will be. But if you are in Christ, 
this is where you're going to be safe. Not just coming to church, obviously, but this is where you can learn about Christ, about his salvation, about how you can be found and be covered by the blood of Christ. And in conclusion, we still need to remember that he is still that same awesome, holy, and just God, but we're covered under the blood of a new covenant. And we're invited up that mountain. We're not told to stay back. We are invited up this mountain now. And the, one of the things he wants us to do is when we hear him speak, he says, see to not that you uh, refuse his word, that you fear his word, but that we hear his word, that we embrace what he has to tell us and to, uh, to just revel in what God has to say to us and enjoy and to look forward to hearing his word. When we come to Christ, we are coming to that heavenly Zion. And in Christ, we are safe. So that's my question for us today. Which mountain is your foundation? Without Christ, you are still at the base of Mount Sinai in fear and trembling. In Christ, you are on the mountain dwelling with family, covered with, by the blood of Christ, free from punishment, and free to obey God, and free to worship him as he asks us to do in this latter part of verse 28. He says, therefore, since we receive a kingdom which cannot be shaken, let us show gratitude by which we may offer to God an acceptable service with reverence and fear. Romans chapter 12 says something very similar, and it says, Therefore I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may prove what is the will, what the will of God is, that, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. That is what God has called us to do as well. He has called us to, to do good works. And that good works, part of it is to dwell with other believers and enjoy his presence as we are doing here today. And to share his love with other people. Not to show uh, that he is just a holy God, but he is a holy and a loving God to other people. And that is demonstrated in our life that we do, that we live a holy life, but at the same time that we show love to others. Let's bow for prayer. Our dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your love and for your mercy that you have bestowed upon us, that we dwell on that mountain of family and fellowship, Mount Zion, and that one day we will all together be in that heavenly Jerusalem and be with so many of our people that have gone before us, Lord, and we look forward to dwelling together in unity as one body in Christ. We thank you so much for this opportunity, Lord, to hear your word. We pray that we would take it with us as we go throughout this day. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.